There's a massive difference between a true giver and a false giver, the true light and the false light. The true giver comes from the heart. They may not even know you, but they feel called by God or source to give to you. It's like the right thing to do. So they're not even thinking about it after they've done it, after they've gifted you. They actually feel like you're manifesting through them and it's their duty to see through that you, you, you reap that. The false giver is may, may be very flashy at first. They may take care of the first bill when you go out to eat. But after that, they're going to calculate your every single move to ensure that you bring it back to zero. So they're expecting you to give back, but they're not going to give you that intel, right? But they are taking inventory of everything that's going on. That's a false giver. That's the false light that's trying to appear as someone who's really successful or whatever, when in fact, it's all a lie. It's all a facade. Use your discernment. The third eye is very important. There's something I like to call false empowerment, and that is when a reptilian energy, or we can call it uh, an energy of separation, finds a way to grab hold of you and attach onto your field to create more separation in your life. But these reptilian energies are very masterful at being sneaky and insidious. So they have a way of making you feel really good when you're in that false empowerment. An example of this would be like when you pull away from someone and you don't openly communicate, and then you fuel your entire journey through that negative motivation. Meanwhile, you're pulling everyone's energy at a subconscious level, which is not the compassionate and kind and inclusive thing to do. True empowerment is when you stand in your sovereignty and you say to someone, hey, I'm, I'm having a hard time with this relationship right now. I love you. I'm just going to step away for a while. That's operating from the heart. False empowerment is when other entities grab hold of you and you don't even know it and they manage to make you feel empowered. You guys know me with my crazy analogies. I got one today in my reading. I'm like, where did this come from? So please don't judge me for it, but it made a lot of sense. You can be a 70-year-old girl and want to grow boobs because you want to grow up and you can't wait to be a woman again because maybe you were a woman in the past life and you want to get back to those lessons. You can want that, but it, it won't happen. You won't grow boobs until it's time. There's a divine order to all things in life. There's a sequence. Your DNA has been coded to turn on when it's time. So if you're out there trying to rescue someone or trying to save someone that you feel you can help, it's not going to work. They have to come to that realization on their own. If you're trying to have a Kundalini awakening, it's not going to happen until your guides think you're ready. So remember, in life, everything unfolds in divine fashion. And some things can't be forced forward. You can't plant a seed and expect it to grow overnight. It just doesn't work that way. So be patient and keep working on yourself. I'm going to expand on this at a later date, but I thought I'd touch upon it now and plant a seed. So you know when we say things like, um, I'm on this new diet and it has renewed me. It's the answer I've been seeking and you should really try it too because I've never felt so invigorated. Well, that's part of the reason why you feel better. But you guys, we live in a vibrationally based universe. Everything is energy. Okay, the diet isn't what's responsible for making you feel better. What it is at a metaphysical level is that you've switched your, your matrix, meaning you've stepped out of a paradigm of familiarity and you've entered a new dimension of thought meaning that you're interfacing with new energies, you're receiving new information, you're receiving light that you've never received before, and that's what's bumping up your vibration. Okay, so whether you're a yogi and then you go into ski, or whether you're driving a Jeep and you go into a Mercedes, those are not the thing making you feel revitalized. It's the energy that you're bringing in by switching into this new matrix. That's what it is. Human beings seem to be at this constant state where they're thinking, when I have this amount of money, I will feel this way. When I have this relationship, I'll feel better. When I look like this, I'll feel like this. The thing that we all have to realize and to understand is whenever you amass that amount of money or manifest that body or that relationship, you're still going to feel the same way that you feel right now at this moment, just with that added outside physical benefits. What we have to do first is to go inside, to have our own inner spiritual journey, change the way we are on the inside in order for us to really enjoy the things that we attract, manifest, and attain on the outside. Good morning, everyone. I know my 7-Eleven shirt. All right, so this is an important message. I speak to a lot of clients who say that they're doing something wrong, you know, that they're not manifesting or, or that they have a block. Now, I'm not suggesting that blockages don't exist. <laughs> a lot of things exist. Microchips, psychic implants. I mean, not to scare you, but we've been deeply programmed. However, a lot of times, what you perceive to be a block is really not a block. It's you judging your own experience. And when you manage to subtract judgment out of your life equation, because judgment only roots us in regret or what if I do this wrong, you know, or fearfulness or, or guilt, when you remove that judgment, then you're going to see that the universe has you exactly where it wants you and that there are lessons concealed in your current situation that are trying to teach you something about yourself so that you can then move into that next chapter. So please stop judging your experience and start trusting that you're exactly where you need to be and that there's a lesson right here picture the other day of thousands of people meditating together in Thailand and one of the biggest comments actually on that picture was that these positive thoughts just sitting in this space of awareness doesn't really do shit for the planet it doesn't help the world it doesn't stop poverty or, or corruption but in actuality it does you see you see the state of the world as we see it now as corrupt as it is is directly caused by a lack of internal awareness right the outer world is affected specifically by how the collective mind views the inner world so by sitting in these conscious spaces by meditating by focusing on good thoughts and raising our energy and our vibration we are collectively raising it in other people whether it be family or friends or unconsciously co-workers and students around us if this became a collective thing and continued growing this internal awareness would change the external awareness and the future of the planet as a whole so thoughts do do something. A lot of people seem not to understand the difference between knowledge and wisdom. So if we really want to improve in life, if we want to transcend the kind of space we feel locked into right now, knowledge would be reading this book, memorizing this book, speaking back about the book, quoting the book. 
But wisdom is when we can do all those things and then also apply what we gain from the book to daily life. We're not quoting it back. We're not trying to replicate it. We are transforming the knowledge we have received into our own version, our own truth, and our own source that allows us to overcome the problems we face. Knowledge is repetition. Wisdom is creation and implementation. It's important to remember a criticism of what you do is not automatically synonymous with the criticism of who you are as a person. We all make mistakes. We all might do things wrong or have un unconscious or unhealthy habits. That's normal. When our friends or family or even somebody online criticizes this or brings this issue to the surface and makes us aware of it, it's a criticism of that issue specifically. You can't just assume that because somebody brings up some uncomfortable truth about you, it means they are also trying to say you're a bad or horrible person. Those things aren't mutually exclusive and you can't make that assumption. You really want to grow and heal and enjoy doing so instead of always being reactive and being triggered by any problem or issue. Remember this. You can criticize what you do and work through the issues you have, but don't assume that it's somebody saying that's who you are as a person. It's usually not. My two-year-old son, Sebastian, decided yesterday afternoon to pour a bottle of water on my laptop. So I refused to miss my Monday weekly energy updates, so I went out and got a new one. Anyways, I wanted to kind of mention real quick that in my experience, that when random, totally unavoidable in a sense, things fall into your lap that just suck, you know, ruin computer, that's no good obviously, that there's always a benefit and a lesson and a positive equivalent to how shitty and annoying the circumstance is. So I've been going through that cycle from, oh my God, what have you done to, I'm so mad about it still an hour later to, oh mind is blown massive massive revelations from my broken computer and in the end it's, it's a total benefit it's a total win beauty in chaos it's it's one of my favorite sayings and we have to if we want to really love and enjoy life learn to find beauty in chaos you know right now i'm, I'm sitting in a traffic jam and, and it's a chaotic thing people are honking getting upset swerving uh, fighting for their lane but there's this kind of odd beauty to it. And so I love being in this experience of traffic right now. And in your life, you have to learn to do this too. Whenever things are chaotic, whenever things are seemingly ugly, if you can find beauty in that in, in some form, no matter how big or small, it will transform your life completely. Here we go. I am packing my apartment right now and I could easily see that this is just my daily humdrum life and that later I get to meditate and have my spiritual life. And this is what's known as a spiritual illusion and many of us fall into this trap is thinking that they are separate things. And then we wonder why we can't get out of this dualistic mind state. Well, it's because you have to get rid of that notion. It's not true. Every moment is our spiritual path. Everything we do is spiritual life if we allow it to be. Whether I'm in my temple with my Swami or meditating or chanting, it is just as sacred and just as powerful a lesson as me packing my apartment or as me cleaning the sink. They are all part of the same divine whole incarnate through this conscious experience. And until we stop seeing these two forms of what we think life are as separate and come to see them as one, we won't grow. But when we do see them as one, that wholeness becomes all we know. Deprogram, then reprogram. That is your mantra for this week. We have to remember that if we want to grow and evolve, if we want to change, if we want to improve, if we want to find true peace, we have to deprogram ourselves from all the propagandized ways we've been taught to live and see and understand this reality through religion, through culture, through the school systems, and then reprogram ourselves with the truth we discover intuitively, sitting in meditation, sitting in silence, reading these ancient beautiful texts that call to our heart center. We aren't really deciding our own path. We aren't really understanding reality as truthfully and as embraceably as we could be when we just don't question it or don't question anything at all. So if you really want to see reality from a blank slate, from a, a divine perspective, deprogram from what you've been taught and reprogram yourself through all the truths that call to you and that you resonate with at the deepest level. When we're thinking of understanding the difference between what is real and what is unreal, all we have to understand is the philosophy of Nama Rupa as it said in Sanskrit, of name and form. The unreal is anything which exists in the abode of name and form. Because so long as it has a name, and so long as it has a form, it is limited to space-time, to the temporal. It comes into fruition and it disappears as well. It is born and then it dies. It is created and then it is destroyed. 
See, this is not the eternal truth. This is what we call the unreal. Anything that is temporal, me and you included, are unreal. But the source of all being, the truth of what is, beyond name and form, beyond any comprehensible way of seeing it as limited, is what's real. And that realness is your inherent soul nature and is mine as well, and is the one thing we all share. Can you believe in a future that you can't see or experience with your senses yet, but you've thought about enough times in your mind that your brain has literally changed to look like the experience has already occurred? Now, the latest research in neuroscience and neuroplasticity tells us we can change our brain to look like the event has already occurred. And can we begin to emotionally embrace a future reality that's a potential in the quantum field and begin to emotionally embrace it to such a degree that we fall in love with that future reality, that our body as our unconscious mind begins to believe it's living in that future reality in the present moment, and we're signaling new genes and new ways to change our body to look like the experience has already occurred in preparation for the event. When you truly do this properly, you're not waiting for your healing to feel whole. You're not waiting for your success to feel empowered. You're not waiting for your wealth to feel abundant. You're not waiting for your new relationship to feel love. The quantum model of reality begins to say that you have to teach your body emotionally how that future is going to feel like before it's made manifest. In other words, you have to feel awe in order for the mystical moment to happen. You have to feel abundance before your wealth can occur. You have to feel in love with life before your new relationship happens. And so we're not defining reality by our senses because we're not waiting for anything outside of us to change how we feel inside of us. So if there's physical evidence in your brain and body to look like the experience has already occurred, physical evidence, relax. Because the experience is going to find you, and it's going to come in a way that you least expect. You might be asking yourself, am I crazy, or am I really going through a spiritual awakening like my intuition is suggesting? I can't help but suspect that I might be going a bit nutty right now, because no one in my life seems to be having these experiences that I am. And here's what I say to that. I get that question all the time, is that this, it doesn't matter. Maybe you are crazy. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe we're all crazy. But here's the thing. I've used the notion that I am going through a shift in consciousness and sort of lived by that belief. And consequently, my life has improved. My relationships have improved. My, uh, my level of abundance and freedom and happiness and spiritual connection has all improved dramatically under this potentially faulty premise that I'm going through a positive shift in consciousness. It doesn't matter. Do you find yourself waking up around 3 a.m., staring at the ceiling, wondering why the heck your body is exhausted but your mind is wired and not letting you sleep. This is so common after a, an awakening and it's for a, for a good reason. It's because when you start to go through an awakening, there's an energetic shift that begins to transpire within your physical vessel and essentially you invite in a lot of new, higher frequency energy into your body. More of your spirit is trying to become an em embodied in your physical body and it's just it's a different frequency and it's energizing and it can kind of keep you awake. It will die down and you will settle and you will adjust but it's a very, very good thing. In fact, what I do, what I used to do when I didn't sleep well, I'd wake up and i get a head start on the next day. Your body will sleep when it needs to. For a while, I don't know about you, I felt like, like I don't want to be here, yeah. why did I come? It was when I started bringing that into my work and, and like helping people and kind of yeah. getting on my mission that I said, okay, now I know that makes sense why I would have come here because it feels good to do this. It's, it's beautiful. That's a good point. That, that's like the, the service element, yeah. which is like what you're all about. And I think that that's like keeps us on track because it can get overwhelming, right? Like life right, <laughs> and yeah. like sensitivity where it can kind of be, like for me, it can become about like say me or just kind of like survival mode, yeah. I guess you could say. Yeah. And then in that space... That, which is what keeps me going as well is like, okay, well, I'm, I'm here to serve. Like, so I, I can't just be thinking about me. Let's like get myself together and then like be able to assist. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I think the service is something that redirects me. Um, me too. For that. sure. Yeah. Here are some suggestions for daily self care. They're not mandatory. Some exercise you've got to live in the body, some meditation. You've got to have a relationship with your own mind. That's not all about external stuff, simple grooming and cleanliness, kindness to other people, doing some kind things for other people. Have you sat down on the phone and listened to someone talking only about themselves? Have you done something for someone else that's purely about them? That's four good things. The exercise, the meditation, the proper grooming and cleanliness, the kindness for another person. These are four principles of self-care. What are you doing for your self-care? You're going to do any of those things. What about learning? Should we add that? A fifth thing. All right, let's try and quickly learn something while we've got a chance. Hmm. Okay, confess things to other people. If you feel like you've done something wrong, share it with another person. There's some nice principles, five principles. Put yours here. Not just there. There. Hey, what's up, my friends? Another tip of the day for you to help you on your awakening, and that is this. To be persistent. Be stubborn. A lot of times we feel inspired to, to go towards something, and then the echoes of our past, the old self, will sort of flare up and play out, and it can seem like what we want in our heart is not meant to be because these circumstances keep piling into our life that seem to block us, and that is when you must be persistent. And just if you know you want something, don't give up, don't stop, don't allow your circumstances to sway you. Rather, keep going forward and allow the old self to eventually die away. And then when you finally get what's yours, what you want, what you've been longing for, it'll be that much more rewarding. Be persistent. Don't take no for an answer, my friends. Peace.
If you subscribe to the philosophy that you're responsible for how everybody else feels, then you're actually not in a relationship with yourself because you're bulldozing the parts of yourself that don't want to do something, that don't want to take responsibility in certain scenarios. You're not actually in a relationship with yourself because obviously to take full responsibility for how somebody else feels, you have to totally suppress, deny, reject, and disown certain aspects of yourself. You're not free. You've lost freedom because you're not choosing with your free will what to be responsible for if you're simply taking responsibility for everything. You're also taking responsibility for things that you don't control in any way or things that in order to control you have to be inauthentic to do so. Here's an example. You can't control if someone dislikes you. They may dislike you because you remind them of their mother. If you're taking responsibility for that, you will fail. You will have to eradicate from yourself or change any trait that reminds them of their mother or work on them day and night like a therapist so they're no longer... We often fall into the trap of telling ourselves that everyone on the planet wants resolution. This isn't always the case. That's especially true if what a person is wanting is self-esteem. If an injury that they've suffered in a conflict makes them feel like they're the bad guy, it's very common that a person, especially the lower their self-esteem is, will want to be the good guy no matter what. Now, when this is the case, they have to have a bad guy. So creating a resolution with you doesn't actually enable them to do that. In other words, creating resolution is contrary to their actual need, which is to feel good about themselves, which they think at this moment is only going to be achieved by being the good guy, which means you have to be the bad guy. Five, pay special attention whenever somebody says something that either creates or fuels a problem between you and the other person. This is when a little bell in your head should go off. What is this? We don't really understand parallel perceptual realities. Most of us only experience a parallel perceptual reality or the awareness of it when we go through something like grief. When we lose a loved one or something else happens that causes us grief, we're sort of in this parallel reality, aren't we? Our life stops. Time seems to stop for us. We can't feel happy. Our perspective about life is completely changing. And when we interact with people who aren't part of that reality of ours suddenly, they're talking about their vacations. They're talking about how frustrated they are at their job. They're trying to get us to join them at the bar. And it's like we may as well be in two different realities, even though our bodies are occupying the same space. The worst part is they don't even notice because people don't often notice what conflicts with their own personal reality. Let's look at some scenarios that one would commonly say money hurts people in this scenario so that I can prove to you that it actually has nothing to do with the money. One, a person spends all their time working to accumulate money and so their whole family feels abandoned. The problem is not money in and of itself. The problem might be that the person has an inaccurate view of the actual needs of their family and thinks that providing is the only means of showing love to their family and not quality time. Two, let's say that a company establishes a monopoly and begins to create business practices which are not actually in the best interests of the customers that they serve. The problem yet again here is not money and it isn't actually greed. What it is is a narcissistic viewpoint. The problem is that the people making the decisions for the company are operating from a zero-sum game because they believe in their state of disconnection that this is possible. They do not see that they're intrinsically connected to those people, so it is only short-term to that partner. Life consists entirely of relationships. We are in a relationship with every single aspect of our life, and therefore every aspect of your life can be treated like a relationship. It's obvious that we have a better relationship with certain things than we do with other things. But if we look at it from this revolutionary approach, all we have to do in life to live a happy life is to improve our relationship with each aspect of our life. We have to become aware of the resistance we have and consciously dissolve that resistance if we want to manifest something in our lives. For this reason, one of the best exercises you can do is to become more aware of the relationship you have with each aspect of your life. To do this exercise, you're going to examine the relationship you have with each aspect of your life. And you're going to do it in this format. Blank, I think you are, blank. For example, money, I think you are, and then a whole list of the things you think about money. For this exercise, I want you to be as brutally honest as you can. This is not the time. We are conceived in connection. We are bathed in the warmth and security of connection from the moment that our mothers hold us against their breasts. We don't even think about who we really are because we are not differentiated. It is in that moment that we are actually closer to who and what we really are. But like I said, we don't think about who and what we really are because the idea is not one that comes up in our psychology. But from this place of connection, we experience a fall from grace. The fall from grace is that deep, visceral sense of connection. We begin to be differentiated. We begin to see the world through the lens of me and everything else. And it's at this moment that we lose our sense of connection. Loneliness is something that all people on this planet experience to some degree or another. But there's two types of loneliness. The first is a type of loneliness that can be resolved. Should we get rid of fear? No. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> all right, so let me explain this. You're not going to be able to get rid of fear because you have a central nervous system. Um, part of being physically incarnated is fear. Um, fear actually is the opposite vibration of love. It's to disinclude something as part of yourself, is to push it away. So I want you to become comfortable with the idea that there are two movements energetically within this universe, the movement towards and the movement away. When I am loving something, I'm bringing it in as part of myself. When I'm fearing something, I'm pushing it away and disincluding it as part of myself. That's what fear is. Now, what we can do is we can practice to move from fear to love. We can't do that by getting rid of fear, can we? Because let's, let, fear exists in the universe, right? If I'm pushing away fear, do you see that I'm not practicing love in that moment? Fear is neither good or bad. It would benefit you to think of fear as information. It is information about what is deeply unwanted within you. This is an interesting way to look at fear, isn't it? Because it means that present in fear is also a deep, although mostly subconscious, understanding of what a person deeply wants and needs. Everything depends 
on how that information that we could call fear is used. The thing is, is that most people don't know what to do with information that falls into that category of fear. This is something that the media must wrap their heads around if they want to avoid even more blood on their hands than they already have. Reacting to fear causes us to do really stupid things. Ignoring fear causes us to do really stupid things. Your task in this upcoming year is to master fear. Realize that we do not fear the unknown and figure out what it is that you are afraid of about the unknown. <laughs> I fear the unknown is a really popular scapegoat, except for it's not true at all. Why? Because if you didn't know, you wouldn't fear it. So what's really happening is that you are afraid of what you are projecting into the unknown. You're afraid of what you think you know about the unknown. For example, I may say that I fear the unknown when I'm talking about my future, but in truth, the fact is, I'm afraid there's an actual potential that my future could be painful because of accidents or failures or any number of things. So the question you've got to ask yourself is, what is it that I think the unknown contains? Face those fears, release resistance to those. Do not be afraid of losing yourself. Nothing has gone wrong. It's a spiritual truth that you can't even find yourself unless you lose yourself. When you look at feeling or being lost in this way, like it's a turning point to find out who you are and what you really want to do, the better off you'll be. And you are closer to truly knowing yourself than most people who think they are not lost but are. If you know you're lost, you know where you are. You're lost. This means that you know that your mission in life is to find yourself. And when you start looking for yourself, you will find yourself. Everything you do can add to your knowledge of yourself and your personal truth, if you pay attention to and inquire into your reactions and feelings. Is it possible to go astray? No. Think about it this way. If your intention for this life was to find yourself, then you have to become lost. So I want to explain to you quickly the meaning of love everyone. Essentially, when Maharaji would often talk to his devotees, especially Ram Das, and he would say, love everyone, love everyone. A lot of people get confused by the idea of loving everyone. They think that to love everyone means to approve of all the bad things, you know, certain people do. Murder, arson, stealing, all these different things. But that's not the case. When we say love everyone, we're not talking about agreeing with what everyone does. That's just not the case. To love everyone is to love their essence because you know it is the same essence within you. That is to say, the same nature, the same consciousness, the all-pervading consciousness of existence in all beings flows through both you and other people. It's non-different. That's why the witness is eternal. That's why the witness doesn't have a name or a face and does not age. So when we speak about loving everyone, we're not talking about approving of what everyone does. There are many things that many people do that I condone, don't agree with, and will actively talk about um, if you know it's brought up. But that doesn't mean I don't love everyone's soul essence, soul nature, because we cannot fully love ourselves until we love everyone. That is to say, if we think we love ourselves and yet we don't love everyone we are only loving a fragment of ourselves a large portion of ourselves so to speak but full love is unconditional absolute love is honoring the loving nature of all beings so when we think of loving everyone remember it's not about approving or agreeing with what everyone does in order to love them it is loving the essence that flows through them which is the same essence that flows through me and you the more you meditate on this and you feel this the more loving everyone makes absolute sense I want you to imagine that within every single person that you meet is a universe. It's its own universe. And nobody knows actually what's inside of that universe. Almost like Jacques Cousteau, right, for the first time, when he was standing on the edge of the ocean wanting to go explore the underwater worlds. He had no idea what the hell he was going to find there. He just decided he was going to go diving into that internal world. So when you meet somebody, I want you to develop this attitude. It's like you are Jacques Cousteau, standing on the edge of that ocean for the very first time. And every time you go into somebody, you're exploring their internal world. Most of us obviously don't think about a person as containing a universe because we're pretty physically focused. And in the physical time-space reality, obviously, how do you fit an entire universe inside of a human being, right? but in the quantum universe, which is really the reality of the... We even find our way to spirituality because we are desperate to escape the way we feel. But then we find that the only way to find joy and to set ourselves free permanently is to walk into the eye of the storm, to be so ready to die as a result of our pain that we stop running or escaping. We stop trying to feel better. We stop trying to change the way we feel. And instead, we walk right into the eye of the storm, ready for it to swallow us up, even daring it to. For the first time in our lives, we do not abandon ourselves. Because for the first time, we do not run from the way we feel. We do not try to use positive focus to move away from ourselves. We do not use alcohol to suppress ourselves. We do not use a lover to protect us from ourselves. All pain in this universe is initiated by some kind of separation. Our birth into this life and into this world is through separation. Separation from our source, separation from our essence, separation from our mother, separation from ourselves, separation from what we fear, separation from what we love. This continues until we find ourselves disconnected and deep in the torment of isolation. 
but we are initiated through separation so that we can find our way back to connection. I want you to imagine that within every single person that you meet is a universe. It's its own universe. And nobody knows actually what's inside of that universe. Almost like Jacques Cousteau, right, for the first time, when he was standing on the edge of the ocean wanting to go explore the underwater worlds. He had no idea what the hell he was going to find there. He just decided he was going to go diving into that internal world. So when you meet somebody, I want you to develop this attitude. It's like you are Jacques Cousteau standing on the edge of that ocean for the very first time. And every time you go into somebody, you're exploring their internal world. Most of us obviously don't think about a person as containing a universe because we're pretty physically focused. And in the physical time space reality, obviously, how do you fit an entire universe inside of a human being, right? But in the quantum universe, which is really the reality of the... The first enlightenment is a personal enlightenment. It is to realize fully that you are part of everything in existence. The second enlightenment is to realize fully that everything is a part of you. The second enlightenment nullifies the first. With the first enlightenment, you can walk the earth thinking that you are enlightened and everyone else is not. With the second enlightenment, you realize that everyone in existence is part of you, and therefore, even if one of those people is not enlightened, then you cannot say that you are fully enlightened. And your work as a teacher for enlightenment begins by dedicating yourself to the awakening of all, quote-unquote, other people. Because you no longer see them as other people, you are dedicating to waking up all parts of yourself. To understand the reason that people react to me the way they do. Consciousness itself functions like water. If you're looking at a river from above, you can see that a large river often branches off into smaller rivers. Due to trauma, which occurs in all people's lives with no exception, the question is simply to what degree, our consciousness splits like a river does. It splits so that instead of whole, we are fragmented. It is easier to comprehend this process of splitting, which is fragmentation, by understanding that any time we encounter trauma, our ego splits in two. But it can do this over and over and over and over and over and over again. This means that even though we have one body, within this one body, we have multiple selves. When you're pissed at someone or you've got some beef with someone, an important thing to remember is that everyone is always doing the very best they can. Always. So whatever behavior has happened, whatever the situation is, you have to know that that person innocently was doing the best that they could given who they were in that moment, what they were believing and what they were thinking. You don't know if they were scared. You don't know if they have a ton of stress going on. You don't know if they have a health scare. You don't know a lot, but all you do know is that every single person is doing the very best they can in each moment. So if you can bring that level of understanding and compassion and try and take on their point of view, it relaxes things because right, you're not trying to be an asshole. Sometimes people think you're an asshole, but you're not trying to be. You are doing Doing the best you could in that moment. Were you perfect at it? Maybe not. I'm certainly not. But I know I was doing the best that I could. Hi, my family. This is a message for everybody who has been fighting against injustice for a long time. This is for you and to remind you that you have to keep going and just keep the highest vision for yourself and for all humanity. So even though you may feel like things are not turning in the way that you were hoping for or you don't see a resolution of the problem, that doesn't mean that it's not happening. You have to anchor yourself to your truth and wisdom you have been cultivating all this time. So trust that you have everything within yourself and trust that the old paradigm represented by all these negative forces is being substituted with a new paradigm. So this is your time to anchor yourself into that beautiful truth that you have within your heart because that is what really matters and that is how you co-create create the life that you really want and you step out of that victim role and you embrace your own sovereignty. You are sovereign. Just when the caterpillar thought his world was over, he became a butterfly. What if, whatever it is that you're going through right now, whatever is heavy on your heart, whatever sadness is surrounding you, what if it was exactly what you needed right now for your soul's highest growth? What if you could lay in the trust, sit back and just surrender to the fact that this pain, this sadness, this self-doubt, this confusion is here for your highest growth? that your soul put it in your past so that you could become the person that you need to be in order to fulfill what you came here to fulfill. You know, right now in the thick of it, it's hard to see that, but we've all been through something in the past that was so crazy, that was so insurmountable at the time that we were like, there's no way I'm getting through this. And here we are on the other side of it, championing life and living magically with, with almost that as an afterthought. We don't even think about it anymore. In the growth process, there's growing pains. And right now you might be in a growing pain. It might be even a small one, but trust that on the other side of that is this beautiful incarnation of you that you could have never imagined. It's perfect for where you are right now because you need this to gain the lesson that you'll take forward into life to become a stronger, more connected, more amazing version of you. So be grateful for this. Surrender to it. Stop resisting it. And welcome. Your natural vibration is very, very high. Anytime you experience lower vibration, it's because you're holding yourself under with some identification. You're holding yourself under. Think of it as a bob on the ocean, a bob. You're pushing that bob down, feeling lower vibrational motion. When you let that go, the bob comes right back up. In the same way, when you observe your thoughts, you're letting go of that bob. You're letting go of it, and that will then allow your vibrational states of consciousness to then raise back up as well. Observing your thoughts allows you to know that you may think thoughts, but you are not your thoughts, and it allows you to then, in a way, transcend parts of the ego. Because the ego makes everything very serious. Everything is so serious when it's in the ego, and you'll feel that way. And when you learn to observe, you can then take life a little bit more fun. You can have a little bit more fun, and when you're having a little bit more fun, 
your vibration raises. And when your vibration raises, you then experience a reality that is equal to that vibration, which you just raised because you stopped holding it on a bob under the ocean. The human being is the most interesting creature on the planet, if you ask me. But when you're young, you were celebrated for having an imagination. When you're young, imagination means play. It means just wonderment. At some point, we get serious as animals called humans. Some moment we go, oh, imagination, that was my childish days. I don't have imagination anymore. I have survived because of my imagination. I have thrived and done things that most people never dreamed were possible for me because of my imagination. I believe that we look up to our visionaries and we scowl at them because they had the courage to play with their imagination. And we, we say Walt Disney and we say Steve Jobs, Thomas Edison, we think of these names because, well, they thought outside of the constructs of most people's logical reality. But it's really, they were willing to play with their imagination. Your unconscious mind is your imagination. It is your inner child. And we make fun of that in society, in commercials and movies. Oh, I'm talking my inner child. And, and we, we tease it. But we all know that there's a child living in us. See, imagination is not just reserved for visionaries and the Walt Disneys. It's reserved for every one of us. The question is, what are you doing to call your imagination out for your own benefit? You see, life loves you. Life really loves you. But if you don't love yourself, it's very hard for life to bring you the goodies because you've got this wall up. Mm -hmm. So when you can learn to love who you are, and that's the way you were born. When you were a little tiny baby, and when I say you, I mean everybody listening to this, uh, we all adored ourselves. We loved our bodies, we loved every part of ourselves. And then we started to listen to other people who told us we weren't good enough, or we didn't do it right, or no, no, no. And so we decided that maybe we weren't very good. And that's where we get all mixed up. But when we can get back to that point of just adoring this marvelous critter in here, uh, then life says, oh, she's got it, she's got it, let's give her goodies. And then the next step is to be very grateful about it. When you're really grateful, then they want to give you more. Oh, that's wonderful.